a little bit about the challenge, which I hope a lot of you will be entering. And outside there, if you didn't get it when you came in, there's some information sheets out there with timelines, etc. on it. But basically, it's um, an entrepreneurship contest that the Miami Herald has been running since 1999. It's, um, we started it as a way to celebrate entrepreneurship, and we've been doing it every year. Um, but in the last five or six years, we've grown it, and now we have three tracks to win. We have a community track for everybody, basically in South Florida. And we have a FIU track for students and alumni at that university. And the FIU um, Pino Center is our sponsor of the contest, and we thank them for that. And we have a high school track for actually grades 8 through 12, because we've had so many 8th graders who, entrepreneurial 8th graders who wanted to enter. So we allow middle school students as well. And um, basically, it's open to anybody with a great business idea or a business, as long as it's under two years old. That's it. We're looking for very early stage businesses in this, in this uh, contest. And the entry is a three-page business plan. You may already have that. You, if you don't, then this is a great place to be because this panel will give you some tips on putting that together. But basically what we're looking for is a uh, three-page business plan that's packed with um, all the goods such as your, your description of your product and service, how you're going to make money, your marketing strategy, who you are and your team, um, what your business model is, etc. And this panel will talk a lot more about that. Um, and we also allow one extra page for a chart. And we always recommend that you use that page for your financial chart. Um, we have somewhat little success with that, but it's a good way to to use that, and it's a good way to separate yours from the pack with good financials. Um, and uh, basically the deadline, that's the most important thing, right? It's March 16th at midnight, and I uh, encourage you to not wait till the last day like 90% of people do, because if you don't, I'm able to at least look at your plan and make sure it opens, make sure it's in the right format and all that. So uh, I hope to see a lot of you. Um, all the information, and rules, judges' bios for all three tracks, advice, all kinds of things are on miamiherald.com slash challenge. That's challenge with a small c, not big c. And you'll find everything there. And so I hope to see a lot of y'all there um, entering. We normally get about 200 entries. It's a lot of fun. And it's good publicity and good uh, ways for you to interact with the the uh, influential judges, which we have a great uh, a number of them on this panel tonight. And one of them I'd like to introduce is our moderator tonight, Melissa Prinsman. She's a co-founder of Trillion Ventures, which is a $50 million new venture capital fund um, right here in Miami. And she's already, the fund has already made three local investments, and this is just in a few months, including one that was announced in the Miami Herald today. So it's great to have another active fund uh, in the town. And um, she also has more than 20 years of capital raising experience with venture architects. Um, and the other thing I'd like to tell you about her is she's our super judge. She's been uh, a Miami Herald Business Plan Challenge judge for 10 years. 10 years? No. This is your challenge. <laughs> This is your 10th year, and um, we, uh, so we're pleased to have her, and I'm going to turn it over to her so she can introduce the rest of the panelists and get on with the show. Thank you very much. Maybe it comes to mind when 
you see this crowd. The first time we did a boot camp, there was about 40 people in a room at the Miami Herald when the building was still there. And um, it was myself doing a, a very slow, boring PowerPoint presentation on writing a business plan. And um, it was an overheated room, um, and somebody had a seizure in the middle of the presentation. So Nancy reminded me of that. And uh, so no seizures tonight, but we do have paramedics standing by. Um, so thank you for coming this evening. Um, what I'd like to do is actually have the judges each introduce themselves, and then we're going to go into some questions that I have for the, for the uh, panelists, and then we're going to have you ask questions, because we think that's one of the critical reasons you have access to an incredible panel. We want you asking questions that matter to you and the rest of the audience. Adam, do you want to start? I'm a partner at Media Capital, and Media Capital is an IT infrastructure investment company. And we got our start with a team of uh, six partners, and we were the executive team at Terramark, which is the other side of the city. I built it with the white balls on the roof. That, that was uh, our facility that was sold to Verizon uh, several years ago, and we ultimately uh, started, we made a started a, a fund to invest in IT infrastructure. I was the general counsel of Terramark, and, and uh, now we're partner at Media Capital and, and focus on helping the portfolio companies uh, with legal and, and, and other uh, other aspects of their business. My name is Leandro Finol and I'm the executive director of the IDEA Center at Miami College. We basically have three outcomes. We help students and community uh, design new innovative uh, ideas, uh, industry agnostic. We can uh, help you with fancy high-tech business for very uh, traditional uh, also startups. We also help you to launch new ventures through our venture accelerator. Wifi, are you here? Or um, we have a, an accelerator and also a, a startup challenge uh, for our students. I see some faces here. And then also we have a, a business growth uh, program. One of them is uh, with Goldman Sachs and the other one uh, is with uh, Babson College. So we help you from idea to launch to grow. And we're open to the community. So uh, we're not happy to help you out. Uh, hi, <laughs> my name is Ben Juarez. Uh, I'm the director of venture investments at the Knight Foundation. Uh, Knight Foundation is a legacy of two brothers who created the largest newspaper chain in the U.S. Uh, we're based here in Miami, um, and so we've been giving to the community here for uh, over 50 years. Um, our initiative in Miami is focused on, um, uh, to some degree, the arts, but also on, on building a stronger entrepreneurial ecosystem um, here. Um, and so, so happy to talk about that. Everybody from the Media Center um, to uh, AGP to Endeavor with a lot of the, um, not uh, directly investing in uh, in companies, but more investing in the infrastructure that can support entrepreneurs here locally. Um, so that's part of my job. The other part of my job is I actually run a fund that invests in early stage uh, media companies around the country. Uh, some of you here in Miami have invested in 40 companies, uh, three of which are, are, are in Miami. All those companies are in some way, shape, or form creating the future of, of news and information. Stack up there. Yeah. Um, Stephen McKean, a uh, proud Miami and Melissa and Nancy, thank you very much for uh, having me tonight. Uh, I am uh, an entrepreneur. I uh, recently uh, merged my company, uh, Acceler, with a uh, uh, JP Morgan uh, back company. The name of that company is uh, Bridgevine. And so the, uh, you know, the last couple of months since we've merged have been uh, very interesting to go from uh, being an entrepreneur, building a company, you know, we, uh, we built it up to about 300 employees to sitting around the table with private equity guys and seeing how they think. And uh, so I'm uh, exiting that process of uh, integrating the two companies and uh, probably going to go back and start another one after uh, figuring it out. But uh, I work with uh, numerous startups here in the community. Uh, advising them primarily on uh, customer acquisition and uh, product marketing. Stephen's actually been a judge, as I said, and has the funniest comments in judging. Um, so, we're, <laughs> exactly. So we're hoping he shares some of that this evening. For the target. <laughs> so. Um, 
actually, I was hoping that, that Adam and Ben could answer this question, which is, so what are the, the first three things that you look for when you're reviewing plans? Lots of plans come into the office, you don't have a lot of time, you have to sort through them. What, do you, what are your the three most important things? Sure. And so, I know it's personal. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, the three things I'm really uh, looking for is, one, what's the problem you're trying to solve, right? Um, and it's always um, helpful. It's actually almost always easier to understand the problem than the solution, right? Um, and so, so start with the problem. Uh, the second question, which actually people almost always fail to answer, is how do you know it's a real problem, right? So some evidence that this is actually, you know, so I want to solve uh, the problem of uh, people, you know, not communicating well enough, right? With all the different, this is like 90% of the business plans I see, right? Um, and then, all right, but how do you know that's actually a real problem? How do you know Facebook or Twitter or, you know, whatever the other million ways people communicate that hasn't already solved? What is it, you know, that you specifically have seen that tells you that's a real problem? Um, and the third is, um, what is it about you, specifically the team, that um, makes me believe that I can, that you can actually solve that problem, right? Um, and as a general rule, the more competitive this, this, the space, um, the, the more important it is that you have a very specific background that makes you, you know, gives you some kind of unfair advantage, right? Um, so if you have the only liquor license for 50 miles, it almost doesn't matter who you are, right? I mean, that's a good business, right? But if, if you are entering, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, a really competitive space, then, then you have to have some really specific advantages um, that, that are, you know, um, specific to you. Yeah, so I, I should have gone first because I, I have a couple of different variations. So, so I guess the first thing is the team is, is really important. And I've learned this over time that what, what, what the team has done and what the founder has done before, what success they've had before, what line of business they were in before is a great indicator of what they'll be able to do in the future. So, so who you are matters and what you've accomplished in the past matters. The other thing, and Ben said as well, is, is you sometimes kind of look at the problem, and, and I don't know if you must see this a lot, I, I see a lot of sort of solutions in search of a problem, where you kind of feel like, I don't know that this is really a problem. And, and so the, the, the statement, you know, when you kind of read these, these presentations and then you go through it, is, is to try to get that feeling. I should, when I read it, understand that immediately, oh yeah, you know, I have this problem all the time. And, and, that, and when you have that feeling, the financials in the back almost don't matter as much, right? Because that's all gonna get figured out over time, right? So it, it's the problem, it's the team, and it's also when you look at the solution itself and the product is, you, know, you see a lot of folks trying to sort of solve world hunger and boil the ocean in one product and, and do too many things. And you see you know, some of these products trying to attack so many different things <coughs> where, where it might be, make more sense to be more focused. And, and so, Focus, I guess, would be the third. So, so when you're looking at the plan, is there anything that you can save the audience time on? And, and I'm not about the application, I'm going to talk about the application next. Um, but in terms of the plan itself, is there any time-saving tips that you absolutely skip over? Anything that you... Adam, you started to talk about the fact that there was the financials. It doesn't, it's not as critical for a first look. Well, and also I should I should also say that I you know, we're focused on <coughs> cybersecurity, big data, you know, SaaS, but so I'm focused on technology. So when I see you know a, a hockey stick to profitability in 24 months, you know that's something that, that is sort of you know it's not even relevant, right? Because what you're trying to do is grow. You're trying to get market share, and if you're if you're if, if it positive in 18 months, then maybe you, you didn't do everything you needed to do to grow, and then you haven't gotten to where you, you need to be. So I think from a financial perspective, I, I think the focus on trying to show that you know this you know this uh, IT product is going to be profitable in a, in a year is not really the most important thing. The most important thing is, is, is are people going to be interested in buying this? Are enterprises going to want to rely on this? And then and focus on that, not just on whether you can run this business so tightly that you'll be able to you know, earn a dollar, uh, 12 or 18 months later. I know from an application standpoint, Nancy and I always get excited if there is even a financial statement included in the document. So I hear what you're saying. Yeah, I, I guess the only, I, this is probably not a time-saving tip, but one thing that is important to think about, and I think I would give extra points, although I'm not actually a judge, but I would give you extra points um, if you included, which is, um, how is it that people are actually going to find out? How are you going to distribute the, the, your product, right? Like a lot of people, 
you know, they, they identify a problem, they talk about the solution, they talk about the team, and there's no actual mention of how people are going to find out about your product, right? And that is um, almost immediately, like if you actually have a real solution, your biggest problem, right, um, um, is, is, is distribution. And so if you have some secret, like hook into, or some, some like actually, well, A, if you have a plan, that helps. But then if you also have a plan that with, where you're capitalizing on some kind of unfair advantage that you have, whether it's, you know, a partnership with a bigger company, or, uh, you know, your own knowledge about digital marketing that you feel like really um, you, you can leverage, or whatever it is, right? But if, if you have a way that people are actually find out about this, um, I, I give extra points for that. I, I would, I would, I would. Go, go ahead. I, I would just add one thing. Uh, I, I've uh, reviewed, I don't know, hundreds of a, a lot of these. Um, I think one thing uh, that really stands out is if you can show evidence of product market fit. So what uh, to build on what Adam and Ben were saying, they're talking about, uh, you know, defining the problem, what the solution is, but you know, also to see if there's a product market fit where, uh, you know, it, 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 it makes sense for this market. So. I see very few plans that, that, that show any evidence of that. Couple of tips, in my opinion. If you're a small, if you don't have a lot of capital, try to go after a small market and then think about world domination later. Facebook, Netflix, they all started with a very small, trying to target a small segment, but they dominated that small segment and world domination came after they dominated a small but growing uh, segment. So think small, but think small that it, it can grow in the future. So, so Stephen, this is for you. So you've seen a lot of these applications. Anything sticks out in terms of the biggest mistakes you see over and over again? Any stories you want to share, plans you remember? Uh, God. I, I think uh, To me, what sticks out is, uh, you know, the quality of the storytelling, I think, could be better. The quality of the writing could be better. I mean, that, that sounds like a very academic thing, but I, 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 I quite frankly, uh, I, I think the quality of the writing could be better. I think to Stephen's point is that you, you have to remember that there's a person reading the plan. And we need to be interested in what we're reading. We have a whole huge pile in front of us, and we're doing it on nights and weekends. And I can speak for the entire judging panel that um, if you have a compelling way to start the plan, uh, it encourages us to keep reading versus do a very quick uh, glance through. Um, so definitely work hard on your, your first paragraph or so and define the problem you're solving. Why should we care? Why should we keep reading? Um, and do we understand what you're talking about? I think where you lose people the fastest is when you start talking about something we have no idea what we're reading. Um, so the one, one thing that I always tell people is share your at least first couple of paragraphs with somebody who doesn't know anything about the business um, that you're starting or that you've already started and see if what questions you get back from them um, and, and then refine it from there. Don't use us as the first guinea pig who is um, reviewing your plan because we're the ones that are, are grading it from a perspective of you um, being able to move on and up the competition. Yeah, I, I think if you think in terms of uh, narrative and telling a story, it's going to help that plan flow. I want to move from plans for a minute to pitches. I know we've all heard in-person pitches. Um, last year we actually heard a couple from the audience, um, impromptu. <laughs> But uh, any, any thoughts on pitching investors in person? Do's, don'ts, highlights, really horrible ones? Yeah, I mean, so it's, this is going to sound really simple, but I think the, 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 the only uh, two tips that I think make sense. One is uh, don't pitch the person you think you're most likely, that's most likely to invest first, right? Pitch somebody who you think is actually not likely to invest because um, you, your first, first pitch is going to suck, right? And so you don't want that to be like, you don't want your pitch to suck for the person who actually you think is the most likely to invest, right? And, and you'll get some good feedback and they say yes, and like all of a sudden you're like, oh my god, I got a killer idea, right? Because this guy, I, I didn't know what I was doing, and I didn't think he was going to invest, right? Or, um, um, and so, and the second thing is, um, particularly if you're doing it by phone, in person it's a little bit easier, but if you're doing it by phone, uh, 
stop, right? Like at some point, just stop yourself from answering the question. And I've had, I can't tell you how many pitches I've had where I asked one question and that's half an hour, right? Like that is a terrible, terrible pitch. Like there is zero uh, chance I will ever invest in that company, right? Um, and so, uh, so you know, if, if it's in person, that, that never happens, right? Because in person, you almost never have that interaction. But for some reason, people get nervous on the phone and they don't see you and they just go, right? Like so, so do, do not do that. <laughs> I, I, I've coached a lot of entrepreneurs in pitching, and, and two of the most common mistakes I see is one, they don't take time to understand the context of who they're pitching, what they've invested in. They just see, oh, this person has money, I'm going to pitch them. And, uh, you know, the, these group of guys up here have a very specific criteria and a very specific stage as to which they invest in. Uh, and I, I think the second thing is less is more. Don't come with a 100 page PowerPoint, come, come with a 10 page PowerPoint. And, and be authentic. I think sometimes uh, entrepreneurs uh, follow too much like a script, and if you if you uh, show as an authentic individual where investors can see through uh, your presentation, I think that would be a, a extremely positive for you. Yeah, I think I would just add to what Steve said is, is to do a little bit of homework on, on who you're pitching. Know their other portfolio companies and whether there's other companies in the portfolio that are similar or that they would have an expertise in your area and you'd be able to talk about that. That, that shows them that you spent a little time understanding who they are and why they would or would not invest. And then I think the other thing is, you're asking someone for money. If they're engaging you, that's actually a good thing. That means they're serious. If they're sitting back and they're not engaging you, then maybe they're just listening and waiting for you to leave the room. Don't be defensive. You're going to get challenged. It happens and, and if you're, if you're going to ask someone for money, they're going to challenge and they're going to try to poke holes because they don't want to understand. So don't be defensive, be accommodating and don't have all the answers, you, don't, you can't have all of the answers, and don't be worried about that, and, and just be engaging in the conversation, and, and that, that will help you get through it. I, I have one last comment, uh, another tactic that you find very effective uh, when entrepreneurs are pitching is get introduced the right way. So I, I, I would suggest if you guys uh, aren't active on LinkedIn and, and building your networks, uh, you should do so, because getting introduced the right way Gives you can give you a huge luck out. Yeah, oh, just one other thing. Sorry, I was just, I was just pulling pulling knowledge. Uh, but but the um, but like so, I don't know if this is true. Uh, but there's a guy, David Rossi. Rossi runs Founders Institute, which is one of the larger kind of entrepreneur networks. Um, um, he said that on average it takes about eight touches, right, from the time you initially um, pitch somebody to the time they put money, right. Um, so pitching is a numbers game, right? Because you got you know think about for each person you've talked to. Um, you got kind of eight touches, you know, whether it's email or in-person coffee or whatever, until that person actually gives you money. The more people you kind of, you know, open that that uh, sort of process with, the more likely it is that you're you're going to um, win. Um, and so, so um, as so, if you're thinking about your first money in, right, um, you know, chances are you've already been through some of those touches, right, um, with some of those people, right? Like if you if you can't get from your existing network. The first money to, to seed your business, you're in real trouble, right? Because other people have already been through that seven, you know, those touches with you and know you well. And most of what initially um, people are betting on is, is, is you, right? Because there's not much of a business around it. And so, so just think about that as if you, you know, in terms of your timing, um, you know, the people already know you, or the people who are most likely to put in the money first, um, and and you know, and the people who don't know you, are just going to take much much more time. Um, and so it's, it's better actually not to pitch those people say, hey, this is what I'm going to do um, uh, in six months when I'm actually going to need your money. I'm just talking to you now and tell you what, what's going to happen in the next six months. And then when you come to them six months later and you've actually done it, people are like, oh my god, you actually did the right thing. Almost nobody actually ever does it. <laughs> so, 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 so then it's much more likely they'll give you money. Um, so, yeah. So. I think what you're doing is building a relationship. And, and um, I, I couldn't agree with you more. We do something. Um, that we started called Office Hours, and we once a month um, meet for a day. Uh, we take on, we'll meet with entrepreneurs. It's a 30-minute either initial pitch or a 30-minute um, update on where the entrepreneur is at. And what I have found is incredible is that about 10% of those entrepreneurs um, who we've said no to because it doesn't fit our filter in whatever way, um, they wind up 
following up on a monthly or quarterly basis with an update. That's not just sent to us, but it's sent to all the investors that they have spoken to, even if it's not in the, in the wheelhouse, because they're updating you on their progress. And I love that, even though I've already said no. And the reason I love it is because it may be that I've met somebody along the way who might be a good fit for them from an investor standpoint, or a customer standpoint, or, a, or an employee standpoint. And um, if they're making progress and they're showing what they're doing and they're, they're writing smart write-ups, um, then I'm likely to be helpful to them along the way because it's building a relationship. So that's exactly what you were saying there. The other thing is I just want to share a real quick story, which is I got here early tonight um, and uh, one of the members of the audience took advantage of the fact that I was sitting there and, and recognized me and said, let me pitch you. Um, and I listened to the pitch and I said, okay, this isn't our area of what we do. And he shared a story with me, um, shared a story which I thought was excellent and a really good lesson for everybody here, which was that um, his father had sold a business to a, uh, I got it right, a company that um, was purchased by Warren Buffett. You all know who Warren Buffett is. And um, the reason he got to the company in Warren Buffett's portfolio was via um, a friend's gardener. And he said, the lesson there is you talk to everybody because you never know who knows who, who can get you to somebody who you can be successful with. So I love the story and wanted to share it. So thank you for that. You know who you are. <laughs> so that said, a um, couple more questions and then we're going to open it up to the audience. I think Melissa made a really good point. I just want to, the point Melissa made about keeping up with folks that have said no or it's not a fit is really, it is a very good point because I, I can just tell you from experience, just because you come in and you've pitched and you know they've said no, or maybe it's because the revenue is where it should be yet, or it's, if something positive happens in your company, don't hesitate to let those investors know because it's very possible they'll bring you back in because you've gotten traction because things have changed and, and maybe you know, so, so don't be discouraged and never contact them again. If there's good news, feel free to let them know because it, it, it could mean good things for you later. So, for those of you that see also plans on a regular basis and are talking to entrepreneurs on a regular basis. Um, what filters do you use? Or do you, I know you have some of you have, some of you have investment, investor profiles or investment profiles. Some of you have other kinds of filters. I was just wondering if you can share a couple more fast filters that help the audience with a time management perspective. Anything? Yeah, I mean mostly it's relationships, right? Like if I prioritize my email, which is always too long, right? I start with people I know. So um, get introduced by somebody who actually knows the person, right? Because that's, um, um, uh, you know, that's kind of rule number one through ten. Um, and then, uh, you, you know, the only other filter is, um, you know, a lot of investors have actually set out um, uh, what it is that they're looking to, to invest in, right? Um, and if you're not, you know, um, at the end of the week when I go through all the emails that I haven't answered yet, I can answer 80% of them by just saying, hey, this doesn't fit our bucket, right? Um, um, and I know what those buckets are. And so this goes back to what Adam was saying before in terms of just doing your homework, right? Um, it's not a good use of your time or our time. Happy to do it, but it's just, it's, it's just you're going to be disappointed if, if you don't do that. I'm happy to say that we have no filters at the ADS Center. We're very inclusive, so even if you don't have the best business plans, we can provide a little bit of uh, mentorship and coaching to at least improve your chances. So, welcome to the DSM. Leandro, you're going to have a line of everything. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Leandro. <laughs> I got in trouble. It's a man of the world blue pants. <laughs> so, any stories or experiences or lessons from um, some of the, the better or worse pitches that you've heard? Maybe, Stephen, in terms of any experiences you've had, or just, you know, I know in, in my lifetime I've already seen some fascinating pitches. Just curious if there's any capital raising tips that you can share. I, I, I'm struggling to remember the bad pitches because I try hard to forget them, <laughs> quite, quite, quite frankly. Uh, no, seriously, I, I, I do. <laughs> so. Well, then the mem most memorable, or anything that, that can be shared here from, from that perspective in terms of just the capital raising, you know, mistakes or anything. I know it's a broad question, but in terms of um, anybody that made a double mark recently. 
I mean, I, so I, I feel like I'm talking too much about this because nobody else is talking. Um, so, 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 so there was a, um, but they, but they, I, I went to a tech, this is not a pitch to me, but there's a, you could probably look this up. If you look up the um, uh, get around pitch at TechCrunch Disrupt, like uh, maybe two or three years ago, um, the get around is a, is a, their idea was they could, you could um, basically rent out your car, you know, like uh, kind of the way people rent out their um, uh, apartments on Airbnb. Um, and they had a technology which would allow you to kind of remotely open the door to the um, to the car after you rented it, and they had you know really good answers for like the insurance problem, which is the major problem around that. How do you rent out your car? How do you insurance? And they had gotten Warren Buffett's insurance company to insure them. And at the end of the pitch, they had a car drive into the auditorium and like sit in the guy on the stage, push the button, and like open the car, right? And like I've never seen anybody um, at, at one of these pitch sessions where the venture capitalists on stage were like, I would like to invest in the company that's on stage. But, like, uh, um, and, and that happened like two or three times. Like two, I think two out of the five investors on stage were like, "I will invest in the company right there." Um, and so, so you know, I mean, there is something to be said for the wow factor. I'm not sure how replicable that is, right? You have to drive a car and you have to have the button that works, and, and they had clearly done a lot um, uh, of work. Ahead of time, but, the button that yeah, works is the, yeah, is yeah, the hard exactly, part. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I I will just share that um, recently uh, we were pitched, and I would say. Don't ask a question you don't know the answer to if you're in front of investors. So what happened was um, uh, a team came in to pitch, uh, asked us a question, and it was really about, do you have this problem? And we absolutely were like, no, no, the three of us don't have this problem, and we don't see it as a problem, and the conversation kind of stalled out there. So I would say, make sure that whatever um, questions you're asking, you kind of have some framework of what the, the answer might be, because that was a, a short conversation, unfortunately, and they didn't know how to recover from it. Yeah. I, I, you know, the one thing, just from, from Ben's car example, is product demo in, in a pitch is helpful, right? If you have a working product, and you can show it, whether it be a WebEx or some other way, where there's something you can see or touch or feel, that helps, right? Because that, that makes it more tangible and that makes people able to understand exactly what it is you're trying to sell. So a car going across the stage is, is a great example, but, but that's just one of the And to that point, I use this example a lot, which is if you have a product, if you're actually selling a physical product versus a service, because we see a lot of tech companies are service-oriented that may or may not have a, a website demo. But if you have a product, bring the product and give out the product because A, people like free stuff, Investors like free stuff as much as anybody else. Um, two, you're, if, at the very least, if it's not a, a right investor for you, it could be a customer for you. So always bring product and, and share and give it away and maybe bring extra so they can give it away because if there's a network effect there. So just another. Oh. Okay. Um, I'm going to take a little of giving you guys some sugar or chocolate or something. Um, okay, so let's talk about South Florida for a minute. So when I started um, working with Nancy, and, um, and kind of kind enough to ask me back, there were, it was a different, it was a different environment. Knight hadn't stepped in to um, really, I call, I always say this, sprinkle fairy dust all over South Florida in terms of getting um, the community activated um, from a, a, an event standpoint and from a bringing experts in and, and from a, a space as a place making standpoint. Um, but now there's a lot of interest activity. We didn't have Starting Gate. If you're not reading Starting Gate on a daily basis, which is Nancy Dahlberg's blog, you ought to be. I will tell you that the investment that we made today was a direct result of me having read Nancy's blog. Because um, then after I read about the company, I reached out and took a couple months, but we made an investment. So um, there wasn't that kind of activity going on. Now there is, and um, I'm just curious from the panel's perspective, um, where, do you, where should this audience go for, for potential investment capital, for places to convene and network? What are some of your best ideas? And if you don't talk about Emerge, I will. So <laughs> that's why don't you start. Yeah. yeah, so so I'll talk a little bit about Emerge and, and, and so the Emerge Nervous Conference that, that had its uh, sort of first uh, conference last year was so the brainchild of, of Manny Medina who said, he kind of just said, we need a conference. And the reason he said that was, 
in the tech space here in Miami, and then we at Terramark when we were in tech, it was, it was hard finding people when we needed to hire. It was hard finding people with a technology background, we people that were coders, people that had experience. It was hard in South Florida to find, there were only you know, a few companies, there were Citrix, South and Broward, only a few companies of, of real size that, that were in technology. And when we looked at some of the conferences at West and things like South by Southwest, we figured having a, a partnership with the universities, with other venture capitalists and, and private equity firms, with everyone in the community to create an ecosystem for technology would be important. And, and the, the inaugural conference was last year in um, Miami Beach, and it's, it's called Emerging Americas. There were, were 6,000 people that attended all of the top technology companies, the systems, and IBMs, and Dells were there, and there were country pavilions, and it was it was a great first step in creating this technology ecosystem in Miami. We had participation from hospitals, from the universities, that, and, and in this year the universities are even more interested in helping doing this because their engineering programs are key to, to creating that talent here in Miami. And because we want people to come here, we want them to be able to feel like if they get a job here and it doesn't work out, they can get another job in the technology field. So Emerge has been a, a great way to evangelize about Miami about technology, to focus on the fact that we have this gateway that you hear all the time about America, that it's true. And if you're going to demo a product and you're in Argentina, you can fly to New York or fly to San Francisco, but it, it, you might want to just do it at Emerge and, and be here in, in South Florida where it to be. So we're real excited about where Emerge has gone. And the foundation has been an incredible um, help there, too. And it's, it's been um, just a terrific Thing to be a part of over this past year. We now we just uh, announced that NBC has become very interested and involved in, in the conference. It's going to be broadcasting. CNBC is going to be involved. So this is all just great for Miami because I we were in a room a couple of weeks ago where there were uh, investors from other parts of the country that have now scout ventures and others that decided to open up offices here in Miami. That's what we're trying to do. Is create an ecosystem. Just on, on real quick on the merge from last year. I'm assuming it's still online because it was, but Manny um, Medina interviewed Pitbull. And I have to say, I can't believe I'm, I'm, I'm advising people to go watch this video, but Pitbull was fascinating about how he has built himself as a business. And it was one of the best things that I've seen. Yeah. So I would really Also the most tweetable thing ever. Like everything he said was a tweet. It was amazing. <laughs> He speaks his tweets. Incredible speaks sound point. Yeah. 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 But I would encourage you to go online, look up the Emerge website, and look for that video and watch it. It was fabulous. And having him involved, you know, having people involved was, was important because he, Mr. 305, he, he's all about Miami. And so this was important to him to be a part of this. And, and so that's why he, he was there and he's going to be a, a big part of it this year, too. So. Well, I just wanted to make a comment. It's a great decision for you to be participating and I invite you to be part of the ecosystem. This is how we are all connected. Knight Foundation gave us uh, over $2 million to fund the Idea Center, Manny Medina, President Medina Capital, Isinor Board. Uh, we shared uh, years of young presidents organizations. So it's it's an ecosystem that is very open and if, if you're part of it, opportunities will come to you as well. So definitely uh, be part of the ecosystem and the doors more doors will open for you. And then just introduce us to a deal that we may invest in. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, I, so it, all, it all starts and stops with Ben. <laughs> right, exactly. So, I mean, and, and, and I'm on the stage. So the person who actually runs our Miami program is a guy named Matt Hagman, who, um, uh, so, who should get the lion's share of the credit. Um, and and uh, we funded over 100 or so grants, I think, in the last two and a half years, so I can't go through everything that we funded. I, I think um, some of the things that, that um, would be, should be interesting to you, Refresh Miami, if you haven't already heard of it, it's probably the largest meetup group um, for, for um, our early stage entrepreneurs um, in South Florida. Um, they have a, a meetup every month. Usually there's uh, you know between three and 500 people that show up um, and have a, a really good speakers. Um, uh, the Lab Miami, which is in Wynwood, is a co-working space um, specifically for startups. Um, they have a lot of events that are hosted there. Um, I would go check it out. It's cool. It's in Wynwood. There's a lot of stuff happening. Just, you can get on the mailing list. That's yeah, you should get on the mailing list there. Um, accelerated Growth Partners, if you have a, a kind of more of a tech-oriented business, a, a, a high-growth-oriented business, is a good um, place to, to start if you're actually looking to raise capital. Um, there may be 70, I think at this point, 70 plus members of AGP who are local members of the community, accredited investors who are looking to invest. Um, they've done, um, I, I, since August, they've done north of, I, I don't 
know, they've invested over a million dollars. I think, I don't know if that's public yet, but there, there, there you go. It is now. Um, uh, and, and they've, they've done a bunch of deals. AGPMiami.com. Uh, yeah, AGPMiami. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, AGPMiami.com. Um, there is also Endeavor. If you have a business where you're actually um, generating revenue, um, maybe a million or two million dollars in, in revenue, up to about $20 million in revenue, that has the potential to become a $100 million business. Um, it's a great network. It's nonprofit. Um, uh, you, you know, it's basically what they call mentor capital. So they'll, they'll um, kind of coach you here locally, and if they think you're um, uh, uh, sort of well enough advanced, they'll bring you to a national level and bring you uh, put you in a national network of of uh, mentors. So just look up Endeavor Miami if you're kind of in that category. Um, and there's you know like dozens of stuff that I've left out. Um, so so just it comes up afterwards. If you want. Yeah, I, I I will pile on because I I've got to travel through this ecosystem and. and to give a perspective, you know, Leandro uh, referred to it uh, before to take a macro view. So there's this organization out there called YPO. They're they're not very public. Uh, have to be about I think it's now 12 million in revenue to get in. And uh, when I joined back in 07, we had about 50 members in Miami. Now it's at 160. And you know I, I really see YPO as a proxy for you know, the, the, the maturity of the entrepreneurship. Uh, but you know, when I take a look at entrepreneurs, your ability to grow a company is a function of how fast you're able to learn. And I, I would really encourage you that the fastest learning is gonna come from those uh, that you surround yourself with. And uh, you know, whether it's, it's these uh, platforms these gentlemen are talking about, or joining EO, or joining you know, some of these uh, more industry focused, I, I think you have to keep in mind um, it, it, it's part of who you know, and the networking, you know, uh, solves some of that, but the, the world is changing so fast. You, you can't learn everything on your own. You, you gotta know people who, who, who know stuff. And, and I'd, I'd love, add one last thing, the endeavor. I, I've mentored probably half a dozen entrepreneurs. It is a real deal. That is, yeah, yeah, no. endeavor is, 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 is amazing. And, and if you get to a million or two million, I, listen, I, I have no stake in it, but, um, I, I've gone through the process with several entrepreneurs and I've gotten to follow up with them on the back end. It, it, it's a real difference maker. Uh, in, 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 in. And, and to the other end of the spectrum, there's also something called Lawful Wednesdays that um, that Will, Will Weintraub started. Um, he, he started Live Ninja. It's a scrappy startup. They've been raising capital. They're now growing. Um, but he started a, a, just a little get-together networking event on Wednesdays that cook waffles in their office. And so you can also start your own networking events and, and create your own ecosystem of contacts and support and help. Um, and his is taken off. People show up. It's a, yeah, it's a I feel obligated to point out that we also funded the waffles. But, but that was the best <laughs> investment we ever made. Like, <laughs> All different kinds of waffles. Um, but I would, I would say one last thing here, which is also the key is be prepared. What I've seen so much now with these office hours that we've been doing is that there are so many entrepreneurs who um, aren't prepared, quite frankly. And there are so many resources now. When I got into this space 15 years ago, there was a fraction of the amount of blogs and books and TV shows. There was no Shark Tank. Um, lots of resources now so that you should know how to pitch. You should know what the do's and don'ts are. And when we just had somebody in our office um, who who bombed so bad and, and had no excuse for bombing in terms of the process, didn't have a presentation, got defensive when we asked questions, um, couldn't, didn't, it was a tech company in a security space, didn't bring the tech person who could answer the tech questions, talked in generality, didn't have numbers, didn't have a growth strategy. We just, we, we basically had to stop and, and talk about where they could go to get information so they could have done a better pitch. And so, I, I hate to say it, but I think that there are fewer excuses for not doing a better first job at pitching investors now. It's a lot easier 15 years ago. You could bomb away and people weren't gonna hold it against you. Yeah. Um, so I would encourage you to find those resources. Nancy Starting Gate has all of the events listed every week. There are resources, there are blogs. You should be following investors. There are some famous investors out there. Um, I don't know, you all might all have favorites, so I want everyone to say there are books to read. If you, Brad Feld has a book on every single vertical of, of raising capital. So, so it's shame on you if you don't go out and find those resources first before getting in front.
front of, of a group of investors at this stage of the game because of all the resources that are there. I decided to stay during winter break, so I thought I knew kind of a lot about startups, and then I found out that Y Combinator with Stanford University launched this series, How to Start a Startup. So I took the time to, to go through it during my winter break. I was totally impressed. It's free, and you have no excuses not to watch it because it's free. It is unbelievable, the, the amount of amazing information that you will receive. So I encourage you to Google that, how to start a startup from San Alpha. Any comments for uh, yeah. no, I, well, I think, uh, Sorry, just to go back before I forget on something that you said before. And, and, uh, I think Fred Wilson's blog is amazing, and I think, I, yeah, I, I think um, uh, Mark Suster's blog is also very sorry. good. Um, um, but but I would say um, just uh, uh, to uh, go back before I forget on the on the pitching stuff. You know, the, the, you got to remember again if it's if it's eight kind of touches to get to an investment. Um, the the point of any individual interaction is just to get to the next interaction, right? Um, and so it's not necessarily to sell. Like you're not there to close on any given interaction, right? You're just there to get um, to get to the next interaction. And so when you send somebody a deck, the point of the deck is not to necessarily explain your business, the entirety of your business, right? Um, that's why a three-page business plan is opposed to like a 50-page business plan. It's just to get to the point where they're interested enough that they'll invite you in and you have the conversation that Melissa had, right? And hopefully you're more prepared than you than you are, but that's, you know, but then, but then, then those people were, but that's it, right? So, so just when you think about that, it's just kind of it's an evolutionary. One comment on, on resources. There was a book uh, put out by Ben Horwitz last year, The Hard Things About Hard Things. Seriously, uh, you know, so a, a lot of these blogs do a good job of explaining you know, the process, what you need to do. Ben Horwitz will explain to you how you'll feel <laughs> during that process. I, I would highly encourage that book. Yes, sir, I, would, I would second that. And also, the Y Comedy, the y Comedy series is outstanding, it's amazing. Um, and I also, <coughs> I live south, and so I, I spend a lot of time in the car, and so I've, st I've started uh, listening to podcasts, and, and there's, and Jason Calcanis has now a series that, that is really good, on, that he's kind of copied with Sam Allman did with his launch incubator, where they have some great talks. And then there's also a startup podcast that is just so much fun to listen to, and if you're starting a business, you'll be able to relate to it. There, there's some, some really funny, you know, it, it's someone who doesn't have any experience starting a business, and he's trying to pitch a legendary Silicon Valley Investor Chris Sockett. It's just, you know, there's some really incredible things. Yeah. And you learn, the best way to learn, I mean, actually, Andreessen Horowitz has a podcast that's worth listening to. It, it, you know, so it, Brad Feller's blog is, is worth reading. So there's so much out there to learn. And, and I, I've recently been listening to podcasts just because I'm sitting in the car. Yeah, no, I, we're, so we're investors in Gimlet Media that produces uh, Startup. Yeah, but, um, but yeah, you should definitely listen to Startup. It's amazing. Like Alex Bloomberg, who's in This American Life and, and big NPR guy. Uh, basically, it's his story. It's amazing. Um, also, Eric Reese's book, The Lean Startup, which goes back a ways, but like it's it is the canonical framework for the way people think about tech businesses in particular. Um, and so, if you, it's it's a really easy read. If you can't get through it. I have a summary. I'm happy to share it with you. Like it is, it is. You really just need to understand that concept of you know product market fit um, that Steve was talking about. Like it just there are a number of concepts in there that if you don't understand them and you're talking to um, you know people who are investing in tech businesses, you're going to get disappointed. So thank you. We want to give the stage to the audience now.